So um, welcome everyone to uh, our third press conference of uh, this year's virtual EGU, the EGU 21. Uh, this press, press conference is titled New Geoscience Tools, Novel Applications. Uh, and this year's uh, EGU, we have more than 14,000 abstracts and 16,000 people from across the globe participating in the meeting. Uh, so I'm Erin Martin-Jones, this year's EGU press conference assistant, and I'll be hosting today's press conference, which will include a question and answer session uh, following on from presentations by our three speakers. So to allow members of the media to ask your own questions, we're conducting this as a Zoom meeting. And once the last speaker has finished, please write the letter Q in the chat box to ask a question. And I'll call on you in the order that the questions are asked uh, to come back to you. And of course, you're welcome to write your, your question out fully. And I can also uh, read that out from the chat. And hopefully this doesn't happen, but if for some reason Zoom should suddenly quit, uh, we'll just restart the press conference and we'll give everyone a couple of minutes to rejoin the session. And likewise, if you have troubles at home with your, with your own internet, that's fine, come back through and someone will be around to let you back in. So there's lots of information on our online press centre, that's media.edu.eu, so you'll find the abstracts and other documents relating to the press conferences here, um, so please check there for more information. And I will introduce our three panellists now to make for faster transitions in between them. So as I said, this is new Geoscience Tools Novel Applications, press conference three. And first up we have Dr. Stephanie Ipma, uh, who is postdoctoral researcher at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. Hi, Stephanie. Uh, next up, we have Dr. Eunice Isel, who is a doctoral candidate at the Christian Albrechts University in Germany. And last but not least, we have Veronica Tolena, who is doctoral candidate at the University Libre de Bruxelles in Belgium. So uh, I'd now like to call on each of our panelists to provide us with a brief presentation and we'll start off in that order. So um, Dr. Ipma first, if, if I could hand over to you and you could unmute yourself. Yes, thanks a lot for the introduction. I'll start sharing my screen. <laughs> yeah, I hope you can see it now. Yep, got it, yeah. Well, thanks a lot for inviting me uh, to this uh, press conference to take part. Um, today I will be talking about the project Galapagos Plastic Free. Uh, it's a huge initiative from the Galapagos Conservation Trust based in the UK um, and uh, with, together with many other collaborators, among which us at Utrecht University. So we are physical oceanographers. That means that we're really interested in how plastic floats around in the ocean, uh, where it's coming from, and the focus of this talk, uh, how it then uh, arrives at these islands. Because these islands are uh, pretty special. Oh, one too much. Um, uh, when you think Galapagos, you might think pristine beaches or nice weather or maybe Charles Darwin um, and you find these very unique creatures here that you don't find anywhere else uh, on earth. And there, there are many more reasons why these islands and also uh, the marine reserve surrounding it, why they're a UNESCO heritage site. So it's kind of this natural laboratory uh, to study how species adapt to uh, changing environments, which is quite relevant nowadays. And the reason for this unique biodiversity uh, can be attribut attributed in part to the ocean flow. So you have these three main ocean branches that meet near, the, uh, near these islands and they all bring these properties and together they kind of form this melting pot for life. Um, so that, that makes these islands very pretty unique. But unfortunately, these ocean currents also transport quite a lot of plastic towards the islands. So they find about eight metric tons of plastic each year on the, on the beaches. Um, and people that, that organize these cleanups, they estimate that they, they have visited far less than 1% of the coastline of the Galapagos Islands. So it is eight, eight metric tons. It's, it's really a huge underestimation and, and there will 
probably be a lot more uh, plastic out there. Um, they think that the main source of the plastic is not, it's not from the, from the islands themselves, but ma mainly from the fisheries and also from the mainland. Uh, about 40%, 45% of the plastic used uh, along the East Pacific coastline of South and Central America is actually mismanaged. And that number is only increasing. And unfortunately with the COVID pandemic, it gets worse as well. So uh, it's a pretty huge threat to the global coast islands, both for the wildlife and also for uh, tourism as well. So to tackle this problem, in the part of the project is focusing on the sources and trying to improve the, the, the uh, waste management. Uh, but a big part of the project is also focusing on the cleanup and how to make that as strategic as possible, because they just don't have the resources also financially uh, to clean up the entire coastline every year or every day. So that's what we are, where we are come in and we are trying to give them a tool that can tell them where to go to have like maximum impact. So this is an animation where you can see locations where uh, in that, at that moment in time, a lot of plastic is arriving. Um, and our aim is then to predict this. So when and where is the plastic washing ashore and uh, how can we then support the really strategic cleanup measures. And uh, the word strategic is quite important here. Uh, so we not only want to make forecasts, but we also want to optimize this model for, for example, how accessible is a specific location uh, what's the impact there on the wildlife? And also um, some of the plastic not, does not necessarily stay on the beach, so it can also return back uh, into the ocean due to storms or, or high tides. Um, so what's the chance that from there it will spread to other islands, so also those regions we want to target. Now, the way we do this is kind of by this, this formula here. So we use a tool called Ocean Parcels, and with that tool we can simulate how, how plastic floats around in the oceans and also how it then arrives at these islands. And that part, so how it moves from the ocean onto the land, there are still quite some uncertainties in that, that um, area of uh, study. So we also execute uh, observations to try to uh, better understand that pro these processes. And for that, we use uh, drifters. So these are floating devices at the ocean surface. They have a GPS and they have a satellite communication so we can really track track them live, study how these, these uh, objects move through the ocean and in particular how they move from the ocean onto the land. Uh, so this field campaign is planned for the summer and we're super excited to see uh, how much information we can get from that. And then we hope to combine these observations with the simulations, apply machine learning techniques and then develop a forecast. So this is gonna be the tool that will tell the park and all the people there uh, where they can best uh, clean up. So this animation is an example of one of the simulations that we use. Uh, you can watch these, or I can at least watch at these uh, for hours. Uh, but all these points are, are plastic virtual pieces that float through the oceans. And there are two colors here. So the, the dark green color, those are the ones that we're actually interested in. So those are the ones that really get stuck on these islands and, and beach. Um, and those are the ones that we want to forecast. So we don't want to run this, this, these kinds of simulations every time. We want to just get like easy velocity fields and from that hopefully uh, understand what is likely going to happen. So this is kind of our realistic scenario and we want to mimic this using machine learning techniques. So one way of doing that is, is we have all these particles, we know where they arrive, we know what day they arrive, and then we can try to find uh, properties that are really similar. And in this way, we can uh, make clusters, for example. So that's, that's applying a clustering technique. And every color here is, is a different color, uh, a different cluster that's then based on, on location. So for example, if we uh, focus on the cluster, the green one, which is in the north of the island Isabella, uh, we can then look at what kind of ocean properties are there on, in this moment of time that we have a lot of particles beaching and can we then understand what kind of physical mechanism are responsible for these beaching events. And that's shown in the bottom plot, we show uh, a difference of the mean velocity field with uh, the velocity that we have when we have a lot of particles beaching at this location. So in, in the red color, you can see uh, it means a stronger flow. So in this situation, we have a much stronger flow uh, in the north of this island and a much weaker flow in the south. Um, and from this, we can extract parameters. Uh, this is just one example, but you can do this for, for all kinds of different clusters. Uh, and in this way, you can get hundreds of parameters. 
And you can use all these parameters and apply machine learning. So there, there are lots of different techniques. I just uh, shown two of them here. Uh, the left one is a, a linear regression and the white one is a random forest. And what's plotted here is, is how well these models uh, are working. So and on the x-axis, it showed uh, the model beaching. So that's, that's how many particles arrive in our simulation, like our reality, so to say. And on the y-axis is what our machine learning is predicting. And the more every dot is located on the y equals x line, the better our forecast is working. Um, so here you can already see that, that the right one, so the random forest regression is working a lot better and it's actually really promising for us. So we're at the moment trying to improve this and using this, um, trying to improve our simulation, hopefully make it more realistic also with including the observations that we will get this summer um, and also improve the parameters that we put into this machine learning tool. And then hopefully at the moment we're really focusing on the Galapagos Islands. But of course, we hope that this regional scale model then can also support uh, efforts of island nations and archipelagos worldwide to tackle the global challenge of plastic pollution and to hopefully make a difference. So thanks a lot for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Stephanie, for that really nice introduction. Um, so shall we move on next to Jonas, if you're able to share your slides? Of course. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, we've got those. Uh, yep. So uh, thank you, Terry, for the invitation to present my topic about geophysical investigation of uh, medieval paintings at the St. Peter Cathedral in Schleswig with georadar and thermography. Uh, our team is represented through Erjan Erkul, scientist for applied geophysics at the Kiel University, Dietlef schulte uh, engineer, Christian Leonhardt, the restaurator of our team, and uh, my working group leader, Professor Thomas Meyer. In the next six to eight minutes, I hopefully will show you why is it necessary to involve more geophysical non-destructive methods in the restoration workflow due to analyzed moisture content uh, in walls of historical buildings without destructing them. But uh, what is it? Yeah, I'm so sorry. Uh, what is the motivation behind my research? Uh, old German uh, proverb says, renovation is only successful when the incoming water becomes less. Or just say it another way, only if you know where the moisture content comes from, you can do something about it. It's so uh, incoming uh, moisture has a strong effects of uh, masonry due to the damage caused by it. So you can get a softening wall by water absorption or by physical chemical erosion, um, microorganism and uh, mold growth, or as it is in Schleswig, damage due to site and gypsum crusts. So on the left side, you can see uh, an example image of uh, the so-called Joch with the medieval paintings here. I hope you can see it, the red lines and some damages, which are in the dark areas and points in this area here. Uh, one of our first aim was to determining an effective solvent for reducing the gypsum crust by using uh, thermography to look how the solvents react with the crust over a couple of months. So, um, and the second aim of our uh, investigation was to test the success of combination of geophysical measurements here, also thermography and georadar uh, for determining uh, moisture content. But uh, before I show you some results, let me quick show you where Schleswig is located. Here on the right part, you can see the northern part of Germany and Orangefield is uh, the federal state Schleswig-Holstein. And it, if we zoom in, you can see Kiel uh, marked in purple on the Kieler Fjord and the northeastern from Kiel is uh, the town Schleswig. Um, so if you get an impression how the church looks like here on the, on the right side is uh, the church. And uh, if we go nearby, you can see the tower of the church just for impression. But we measured inside the church in the cloister, and this is how it looks like. It's a three-sided cloister, and you now can see two of them left and right, and you see the medieval paintings in the dome. But I will 
show you some uh, results from this side of the cloister. So uh, what did we use for methods to um, get uh, near more closely to the damages that they which are there. So first we use thermography for the purpose of non-destructive moisture detection. Uh, we are looking at near surface temperature variations and uh, record them with a thermal imaging camera. And the second method is uh, georadar. Electromagnetic waves are sent in the underground and the analysis of the travel times of the waves allow statements about deeper structures. So uh, a subsequent analysis is to look at the attenuation and uh, the attenuation can possibly allow conclusions about moisture content. So let me show you a result of the thermography. So on the left side, you can see again uh, the Joch um, the dome uh, shows clear the, the paintings, as I said it before, and you can see in a half the, these, uh, Joch, the, the intact areas on the left side and some damaged areas uh, due to moisture on the right side. So during the investigation, the question arose uh, as what, why the damage uh, occurred in this area, and the answer is seen on the right side. You see an average, uh, you see a picture of an average value of each temperature pixel uh, recorded over a time of one and a half hours. And it's just the mean, the temperature uh, average of all one and a half hours. So blue colors indicates uh, cool areas and uh, red colors indicates warmer areas. So what do we see? Here's a built in a horizontal barrier. And you can see the insulting layer in dark blue in this, in this area. So um, furthermore, we see a bulge in, in the right area, which comes from, from here and goes like up to the wall. And uh, it indicates a defect of the horizontal barrier. Moisture rises, mineral reacts, and so gypsum crust forms. Uh, to confirm that moisture is the reason for the gypsum crust, uh, we use georadar. So uh, on the far left side, you can see market profiles where we have measured with a two gigahertz antenna and the image in the middle shows the profile of this measurement profile nine. And by moving the antenna along the profile, you get a two dimensional representation of the reflections in the ground. It's a uh, this picture. Uh, the profile is uh, ends at a height of 1 meter 50. And what you actually see is that dark areas show strong electromagnetic uh, reflection and light areas show weak electromagnetic reflections. And now you see the orange line, which marks the transition from wet areas to dry areas. So what does it tell us now? Uh, let's look at the attenuation. The last figure here on the right disturbs the attenuation of the direct wave and the reflections. So the direct wave is the wave which runs uh, directly along the surface in this time slot here. Uh, so what do we see? A high beta value means low attenuation and a low beta value means high attenuation. And uh, you can conclude that the low beta values are uh, generated through to moisture content. Um, you actually can see that uh, you actually can see that the area of the horizontal barrier uh, is in this uh, field and the damping decreases abruptly. So um, you can possibly use it to identify moisture content. Uh, without damaging the wall by drilling, for example. So let me give a short summary. Thermography and geoda are non-destructive methods to analyze damages in historical buildings, and they are sensitive as a thermography for shallow sources, while georadar is more sensitive to deeper structures. And the combination of the two methods can provide a new insight in the detection of moisture to, non, to not distract the walls of the historical building. So, and if you want to learn more about it, I have a session on Thursday, you can join it. And uh, my poster is also online. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jonas. That was really interesting. Um, so shall we head over to our last speaker, Veronica? Yes, I will share my screen. Thank you. Um, 
Here we go. Now start the presentation. Share. Okay. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah, we've got it. Yes. So I will talk about a data driven approach in the search for Antarctic meteorites. My name is Veronika Tollenaar, and I have been performing this research together with a team of scientists from the Netherlands and from Belgium. Uh, related to the universities in Brussels, the ULB and the VUB, and in the Netherlands, the TU Delft. So um, with satellite observations, we can predict where to find meteorites in Antarctica. This is very important because meteorites form the understanding of the formation and evolution of our solar system, which in its turn teaches us about the origin and the sustainability of life on Earth and also on other planets. So here you see Antarctica. And in 1969, there was a Japanese uh, team who went on fieldwork to this location. And um, somewhat coincidentally, they found nine meteorites in a rather limited area. Uh, here you see a newspaper article published about this very special find. It's really, um, it's not normal to find nine meteorites in a limited area. It's, it's something very exceptional. And so um, from this exceptional find, the um, uh, belief originated that there is a concentrating mechanism that brings meteorites together in specific areas. So basically um, what they think that's happening is that meteorites fall on the, um, on the ice sheet in Antarctica and they become embedded in the ice whilst the ice sheet is building up. And then due to the flow of the, of the ice, the embedded meteorites, or at least a part of the embedded meteorites, they are brought to the surface. And uh, once they are at the surface, in, um, in, in uh, specific areas, they can remain there really for thousands of years. Um, here you see uh, these meteorites um, and uh, in the areas where they are brought to the surface, typically blue ice is exposed. This underlying blue ice, it makes it very easy to see the meteorites when you're in the field. And uh, given that there is a high concentration of meteorites in a limit, limited area, it makes Antarctica a very productive place to collect meteorites. Uh, this is also why 62% of all meteorites recovered on Earth are recovered in Antarctica. Um, almost every year, there are meteorite, re meteorite collection missions to Antarctica. And in these missions, the Belgian equipe is very well represented. Here you see a picture of the last field work they did. Uh, you see the field camp with the containers where they sleep and uh, also the ski doos that are used while searching in the blue ice area. You also see nicely um, how big this area actually is, although it's still limited and there are a lot of meteorites there. Um, so the Belgians, they have been uh, involved in four joint fieldwork missions and they were very successful because they collected more than 1300 meteorites. However, uh, the conditions in Antarctica, they can be very extreme. Uh, the average temperature at places where they found meteorites is minus 36. And also the um, uh, missions are not always successful. In some sense, you need to be lucky to find meteorites. So until now, um, the places where they go to search for meteorites, they are selected by experts who study maps and um, visual imagery. And uh, they have performed a lot of costly reconnaissance missions. Um, of course, these missions are expensive because you need a lot of support to get there. And uh, also there are quite some um, uh, dangerous uh, um, uh, risks that um, are involved in these missions. So um, this is basically where we come in because we want to increase the success of these uh, reconnaissance missions. And to increase our success, uh, we, will, we want to use uh, satellite observations. However, from space, it's not possible to directly detect meteorites because the typical resolution of the data that we use is 500 meters. 
whilst the average size of uh, meteorite finds in Antarctica is a couple of centimeters. So uh, we need to use indirect properties of the concentrating mechanism to predict where you find meteorites. I will give two examples here. Um, you see uh, the ice flow indicated with the arrows. So typically in areas where you can find meteorites, the ice flow velocity is very low. And also you see the surface temperature is also um, uh, very low in areas where they find meteorites. It rarely exceeds minus 10. So it's really cold there. Um, and so we use these um, uh, indirect observations to predict where you can find meteorites. How this goes into practice is indicated here. Um, in, uh, you see all different layers with observations. And uh, again, uh, the two examples I um, indicated, the ice flow velocity in pink and the temperature in green. And uh, basically we combine these observations to predict, uh, to make a prediction. However, um, combining these observations is not as straightforward as it might seem. So it's, it's not possible to make uh, simply an overlay analysis because there is interplay between all the different observations. Um, uh, and so we bring in machine learning because this is a, this, uh, the machine learning algorithm is able to capture the interplay between all the different observations. Um, so basically what it does, the machine learning, um, it spits up uh, the data into a set of training data and a set of calibration data. We give the training data to the machine and uh, we see how good it can predict based on the training data by using the calibration data. And then, of course, we go back to the first step because uh, um, usually in learning there is some iterative process involved. And then um, in the end, we get a prediction of where to find meteorites, as shown here on the right. This is a snapshot of the continent-wide product we are making. And um, the results uh, we obtained are evaluated with unseen test data. So this is uh, data of uh, places where meteorites are collected or places that turned out to be absent of meteorite finds. And this data has not been used for training or calibration whatsoever. It's just completely unseen by the machine. And we use this for the evaluation. So um, the results of our evaluation, um, it indicates that um, the meteorite map we made is a great advancement over the current manual approaches in meteorite searches. And basically we can create a kind of treasure map of Antarctic meteorites using uh, satellite observations. Um, also, uh, there are indications that there are still a lot of meteorites, really many more meteorites to find in Antarctica. And we believe that our treasure map will be a great asset in the meteorite hunting missions, uh, allowing a targeted approach to collecting the remaining meteorites. Um, our research will be peer reviewed. And at the meantime, uh, we are making an interactive tool, not only for scientists, but also for the general public to just uh, explore the continent of Antarctica and um, the meteorite uh, collection, um, the meteorite concentrations that are in Antarctica. Um, I'm very happy to share this tool or other um, results or um, um, materials. So don't hesitate to contact me on the following email address. Um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. I really like the idea of this, this treasure map as you've described it as well. That's cool. Yeah. So we've heard from all three of our speakers there, three really cool and diverse topics. Um, so I'll now open up the floor for any questions. Um, as I said at the start, if you've got questions, you can either type a Q, a letter Q in the chat box and I'll come to you for questions. Um, or um, you can write out your question fully and that's absolutely fine. I can also read them out from here as well. So yeah, any questions for our speakers? Um, okay, can I speak? Yeah, I think, go ahead. Okay, yeah. so yeah, I think it's easier. If, um, I have a question for Veronica. 
so you mentioned uh, satellite satellite observation, and I was wondering if also this method has been also coupled with um, with um, surface observation with surface surface geophysics geophysical techniques. Um, thank you for your question. Uh, I think uh, it can definitely be combined with surface observations. Uh, however, um, the areas where meteorites are found, they are really scattered over the over East Antarctica. And so um, the surface observations in, in this area, they are rather sparse because it's, it's really more in, 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 in towards the interior of the continent and ex the conditions are really extreme and it's hard to um, have a lot of uh, in situ uh, campaigns there with continuous data. So uh, it is possible for more local analysis, but for the continent wide analysis we are aiming to make, uh, it, um, it doesn't, uh, it's not usable because there's no coverage. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Veronica. Um, so we have a question for, for Stephanie coming in from, from Sarah Derwin. Um, can you speak a bit more about how your work could be used to help drive waste management efforts on neighboring places? Yes, great question. Um, so I'm mainly focusing on really the physics part of this to really understand how the particles are flowing. But of course, as I said in the beginning, it's part of a much bigger project. Um, so there's actually a Pacific, uh, well, this is Southeast Pacific wide uh, project going on to really include all the neighboring countries. So Ecuador, Peru, uh, Chile, et cetera. Um, and so we, we in particular want to um, uh, uh, find case studies where we can apply our tool and see if it works for different locations, not just for the Galapagos. Uh, but what they are also focusing on is just uh, improving using education, um, talking to the governments, trying to implement better waste management strategies. Um, and the way we help with that is also look a little bit at the sources. So if we find plastic on the Galapagos, can we find out where it's coming from? Uh, what is the main source? Um, can we tackle those companies or uh, should they uh, focus on cleanups on the beaches on the mainland or should they focus on better waste management um, flows, things like that? So. I hope that helps. <laughs> Sarah says, excellent, thank you. Um, I was wondering as well, Stephanie, um, you, you, showed a, you, you showed a slide with a map on it and it had some dots showing where you're tracking your, your plastics. I, was, was that supposed to be an animation? Ah, Possibly. yes, did it not yeah. say? No, but we can, we can, I think we've got time to watch it again and have yeah, a look. Yeah, I'll try it. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. I think that there's a trick. Uh, Fabio, is this right for sharing that you might have to, um, so when you get the option to share screens, you might have to tick a couple of options in the bottom left. Uh, okay. Yeah, because it's a gift. Oh, so. oh Sorry, there you go. It? It's going. Oh, it's going. Okay. Okay. And there were, there were more uh, animations, so it's a bit sad. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, this one is the nicest, I guess. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, if you want to talk us through um, and sure. if you want to pull out anything from them, that's absolutely fine. Uh, yeah. So this one is just a simulation with that ocean parcel stool that I was talking about. So uh, these are virtual, virtual pieces of uh, plastic, so to say. Um, and the dark ones here, those are the ones that got stuck on the islands. So you can really see the islands getting contaminated more or less yeah. with, with thoughts. <laughs> um, so yeah, we really like to just sit back and check this out for <laughs> many hours. Um, yeah, the other one was in the beginning. I'm, let's see if I can go back. Um, so this was more to explain uh, what we hope to develop in the end. So it's kind of showing if the, if the color is darker, there are more, more pieces uh, arriving at that location in time. So um, yeah, so this is all simulation, yeah. but hopefully in the end there will be a combination of observations, simulations, and things like that. Um, yeah. Excellent. Um, so Sarah's got a, a follow-up question to that. Let me find it. Um, will your will your drifter floats 
<laughs> help mm -hmm. you to identify the biggest sources. Sorry, I had to decode that a bit. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, maybe indirectly, I, I can explain a bit more about that. So, so what we are using the drifters for at the moment, so we, we've ordered 50 of, uh, of them and we're in the process of getting them transported to the Galapagos uh, at the moment. Um, so, so that field campaign is mainly focusing on, on how the plastic moves from the ocean onto the beach. So that, that's that process, there's, there's still quite a lot of unknowns. So that's what we, we are focusing on with this drifter field campaign. Uh, there were more planned, also larger scale, uh, to uh, get a better uh, indication of the ocean currents, because that's, um, of course, that's all models at the moment. Uh, it's really difficult to measure the ocean. We can talk about that for a really long time. Uh, but that was a much bigger uh, field campaign, also much further away from the Galapagos, really large scale flow patterns. Uh, but unfortunately, there are a lot of uh, funding cuts in the project. So that part is, for now, at least not possible. Um, unfortunately. So we have to cross our fingers for the future. Yeah. Fingers crossed. Thank you. Um, so we will hop back to Eunice for, for a question from Philippe. Um, and Philippe says, can these tools be used to repair damage in the future? No. I hope it is possible in a long time, but uh, first of all, it's to detect moisture without drilling uh, in the walls. So actually today you are doing some course to get information about uh, moisture content in the striker walls. And if you wanna have um, it all over the wall, you have to do a lot of course. So, and what we are wanted to do is to reduce this and uh, just take three or four cores uh, on the wall, and then just uh, measure with radar and thermography to get an information about uh, where is water content and where is it not, and uh, how you can see in a faster way, in an especially cheaper way, and in a faster way, uh, where water is and what you can do uh, just before you start to restore your object, before you're doing the restoration. So. I hope that's Thank okay. You. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, another one for you, Eunice, from Sarah. Uh, how thick do the walls need to be for your technique to work? Can this technique be used on different mediums? It's better if it's thin because uh, the georadar has a uh, penetration depth, but we tried it in Neunkirchen. It's another church in Schleswig-Holstein. And uh, there were the wall about two meter a one two meter so one meter ninety maybe this thickness so it works great on uh, historical old churches especially so it doesn't matter how thick your wall is maybe, of course there's uh, some regulation about the thickness but what we tried worked well. Thank you. And uh, from Philippe, and this is back to Stephanie, um, can the modeling be also applied to areas like the Mediterranean or Californian coastlines? Yes, uh, yeah, it can be applied anywhere. <laughs> Let's put it that way. I know we, in our group, uh, there's a lot of work being done on the Mediterranean. So um, yeah, you can check out our I don't know where it is, our <laughs> Twitter and you will find some uh, research related to that. Um, uh, it is still quite a work, quite a lot of work, and what we're doing at the moment is really confined to the Galapagos. So uh, before we can scale up to other locations, we have to see what what are the parameters that that will be uh, applicable worldwide uh, and not just for the Galapagos. So that's that's one step we need to make uh, in the future to make it sure that we can apply it globally. Cool, exciting. Yeah. <laughs> Any more questions for our panel? Any more? If not, we can we can leave it there. And um, all that all that remains to say is, yeah, thank you for our, our three panelists for their wonderful talks and taking time out to answer your questions. Um, and you can also have a look out for more of the, the content and materials related to these talks uh, online at the EGU Media Center. 
uh, press center. And I'm sure all of our speakers would be happy to be contacted by email for, for follow-up queries if you've got questions.